Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have another fascinating guest today. Um, I have uh, with me Wes Roberts. He's an experiencer of ET Contact. Um, if you guys are familiar with Leslie Mitchell Clark, which you should be because she's been on my show twice, um, this is the person that, the man that Leslie and her wrote a book together. It's called Intersections, a true story of ET Contact. Leslie was his hypnotherapist and Wes was the experiencer. And let me just read you a little bit. And he has a new book out as well. It's called An Experiencer's Garden. And I, I just want to read you a little bit more about his bio. A 30-year contract college professor, Wes Roberts had hints of alien visitations dating back to his teens. Throw off of times of frustrating nighttime experiences. This became a consciously recalled experience in the 1980s. Wes eventually became convinced his experience could not be explained away by conventional theories. And again, his books are Intersections, A True Story of ET Contact, and An Experiencer's Garden. And uh, I want to give him a big warm welcome to the show. Wes, thank you for coming on. How are you? Robert, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, I'm good. I was just doing technical troubleshooting for the past hour. This is part of what I do for life, so it's a, it's a relief to be here. Yeah. So how did your uh, uh, ET contact memory start? Do you remember consciously having experiences or did that come through with the, the hypnotherapy with Leslie? <clears throat> Excuse me. I actually approached her because I did have consciously recalled experiences. Um, I had a major, I considered to be a major experience in the 1980s. And then I had periodic uh, experiences, but I, I couldn't put a label on them. So I sort of sweated it out for 17, 18 years till I decided I might be one of these people they call an abductee. I might be an experiencer because I was sort of keeping it at hand's length or arm's length all that time. So I brought to her in my first session um, something about my experience, but that's not actually what happened. Uh, when I first got hypnotized, and then we did five years worth of sessions. Wow. And then what would you say your first impressions were of hypnosis, and uh, how, how did you like it? I love that question. I don't know if anybody's asked me that question before. Um, I, I quite enjoy it. It's so totally relaxing, um, because obviously you've got to get yourself in a in a theta state of some kind, and uh, Leslie does that well. So I find it totally relaxing, and the misconceptions were blown away, both in what Leslie had told me, and then in terms of the first or second session. Um, you don't lose consciousness, you remember everything, you can answer questions. Um, and in the case of Leslie, as a reputable uh, practitioner, um, she doesn't lead you down the garden path, so it just is it's very organic. It's like you're you're accessing a different part of your brain. It's like these doorways, it, and and because I've had it done myself, but I'm not an ET contact mm. experiencer. I'm really interested in um, past life regressions. I'm interested in like what happens to us when we move on from this physical mortal meat suit, you know, physical coil, whatever mm. you want to call it. So I had. Um, a couple of hypnotherapists. One was Terry Lovelace, who he just started in hypnotherapy, but you know, him, he's the experiencer. He hypnotized me because he was practicing and we put it on my channel for the guests to see. And then also I had Fiona Harris. She's from Canada. She's a hypnotherapist. I had her hypnotize me. And each time I went to a death scene and, um, you know, I, I, it was always like a war type situation. It was very interesting. And both times I put it on my channel for people to see. And then I was kind of like 50-50 on it. But now I'm more thinking that it was more realistic because of the fact that when I was in the death scene, my chest was like hurting and I would get stabbed through the chest or shot through the chest in the death scene. So the reality of the past life regression was coming through in my in this life. And I was going to ask you, did you have the same thing? with your ET memories, was the realness of that memory coming through in your sessions? I would say 100%. Um, 
you know, Leslie's careful about uh, guiding you so you don't experience trauma, re-experience trauma, I should say. Um, that's old school. That was when it was, you know, this art was young or the science was young. So she's careful about that. But um, yeah, it's 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 very lucid. You get to re I got to re-examine some of my experiences in detail. And then I learned of a whole raft of experiences I had no conscious memory of until then. Yeah. And then I heard you say in another podcast that you like came away with like some actual physical marks, which we would call scoot marks. I think, you know, I, or I think you said they were a triangle, but I don't know what actually defines a scoot mark. I know I've heard of them. Um, would you say you had scoot marks? Is that what you, what you had from these experiences? You know, gosh, it's possible, Robert. I, I had, um, um, triangles, uh, I would have to say emblazoned on me, um, as if somebody had sort of burned, uh, my chest, the, uh, the triangle didn't stay. Um, there were some interlocking triangles, uh, when I got up one morning and then once on my head as well, and perhaps once on my hand, um, no, no consciously recalled or seen scoop marks. Um, no battle scars, but I know other abductees who wake up with their arms bruised from what seems to be uh, injections or extractions of some kind. I know. It's weird, isn't it? It's so strange because what, what's so fascinating to me about this phenomenon, and you could probably relate to this, is like the nearest star from us is like so far away. It seems like we're all by ourselves here on Earth, but it's not that at all. We're we're being visited by all kinds of ET races, and, and you know, there's the proofs in the pudding. You know, like there's many experiencers like yourself. I talk to them, and I'm a believer. I know my name's typical skeptic on YouTube, but I'm more open-minded. I'm a more open-minded skeptic. You know, like I I'm a skeptic, but I I want to be open-minded. I want to believe, and I I have total confidence that we're being visited by multiple races. So you got to kind of ask yourself, well, how is this happening? And my answer is, I think it's happening interdimensionally at, or maybe through wormholes. You know, like, I, I don't know exactly how they're getting here, but that's what mm -hmm. it would seem like. Maybe they live in a, a near star. Maybe they're from the Pleiades, but they use wormholes to get here. Did you ever think about what they might be using to get here? Or what are your thoughts? I do. I think about it a lot. <clears throat> I think Leslie would agree with me. The beings come to us to arrive where we are uh, in space time in different ways. The, the wormhole theory, um, the bending space, which is basically a wormhole theory, um, the ability to appear or disappear at will. Um, I think some of the beings are interdimensional. I think some are ultra dimensional. You know, I think some are extraterrestrial. Uh, so I, I, I can't even put a label on it. The ones, I guess, in my life are, are extraterrestrial in origin, though they're not physical anymore. Um, but yeah, I think uh, your theory is a great theory uh, because there's no, we tend to put, Robert, our common explanations of physics or science on them, thinking that, oh, it would take them too long to get here. <laughs> and, and that doesn't work for me. You're right. It doesn't. And it's like, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon. I guess that's why we call it the phenomena, right? Or it's a phenomena because it can't be explained easily through regular science or any kind of regular logic, you know? And then that's why I love talking to people like yourself to try to figure out what's going on because it's so interesting to me. Can I ask you this? Like, what kind of races are you being visited by? Or, or are you still being visited? I, I, I'm going to say I assume I'm being visited because of some of the transcripts I've uh, examined while I was under hypnosis or listened to because they're all recorded. Um, I think Palladians, quite possibly. Uh, I think Nordics are tall whites, uh, quite probably. Um, and then there's another species, and I've talked about this on other shows. I don't know what they are. They're not little greys. Um, they're just brown-skinned people. And sometimes uh, Leslie and I have speculated they're the helpers that you sometimes hear about in other abductions. They they help facilitate what's going on with the abductee or the experiencer. 
that's so interesting. Well, I was seeing if you could take us through your 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 most well known experience or your your from what 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 started. What was the trigger point for all this? What do you remember? If you don't mind me asking. Not at all. Um, I went to to bed on what I thought was a normal night. I had a different partner at that point, so we just you know we conked out and fell asleep, and then. The, the experience transition through the sleep state, which surprises me not at all. Um, I think it's worth stopping there for a brief second. We're real accessible uh, when we're in our sleep states. I see you yeah. shaking your head. We're very accessible. Um, we're not quite an open channel, but maybe next thing to it. So that's why things like, <clears throat> pardon me, alien abductions, or alien experiences or alien encounters and also magical uh, encounters of all kind can happen while we're sleeping and dreaming. So I didn't know when I went to bed that night, I was about to take part in a four or five stage or four or five step uh, experience. Each step was distinct, uh, but each was connected to the next. And, and it's, it's funny, Robert, because people, I've had people say, wow, this is a terrifying experience. And, Sorry. There, there was some. No worries. I, I turned that off. It was my stupid phone. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No worries at all. Yeah, I'm looking at mine, hoping I turned it off. <laughs> I'm going right to turn mine off right now. I can't believe that happened. My friends call with the stupidest times. Like, they know I do shows around this time. So, sorry, I turned it off. <laughs> no worries at all. No, I get it. Mine's done that too. So I, I didn't know this would happen, um, and it began with me at an airport. I don't know if it was the airport I live, uh, the city I live in, if it was that airport, which is a major Canadian airport. Um, but I found myself there in the middle of the night with no one else around, uh, which that should be enough, right, to clue you in. It's like, what am I, how did I get here to this airport with no one else around? And it was just dark, and I was at a terminal of some kind looking at, looking at uh, jets, uh, take off. I don't know if they were physical or not. Uh, and then at one point, one of the jets, uh, part of it burst into flames. And, you know, you can imagine a shock and horror. I'm looking at this thing through the window. I think it's all real, uh, real like waking world, real. And so I saw it burst into flames. I'm looking around me in a panic. I get a sense that there's somebody off to the side of me. Um, I don't know who or what it was, one of these brown skinned people or aliens. And the next thing you know, I'm on the plane. And so that was stage two. Wow. Uh, so it stop me if you need to, Robert. It's cool. No, that's fine. You can keep going. I, I'm, I'm just like, so going, there a lot, a lot happened in between that time. I'm guessing that you um, uncovered in hypnosis, right? Or I've uncovered bits of it, um, which I can certainly talk to um, uh, after I mention the uh, uh, experience, because the aliens I'm connected to thought it was uh, simply like a dry run, a wake up call. Um, it didn't really matter uh, to them <laughs> what I went through. It was sort of like a slap across the head, wake up, you know, wake up and, you know, get with the program. Um, so I'm on the back of the plane, and you can hear the typical noise you hear on a jet, the turbines, the air hissing, the recirculated air, all that. And I thought, that's it. I'm, I'm toast. I'm done. I actually felt, you know, like heart beating and all that stuff that uh, in a few seconds I was going to die. You know, the plane was going down. Um, and so I literally felt that. I can't explain how real that felt. And um, so I reached out and tried to touch the person's mind I was living with. Uh, and about 20 seconds after that, um, just bang, I didn't feel any pain. Uh, There's a period of blackness. So my eyes became accustomed to the light and I saw two doors in front of me and that led to stage three, which was being inside an apartment of some kind uh, that was too too pristine and too cleaned and too neat to be true, as if nobody had lived in it, but <clears throat> like it was created for me to walk into. And uh, it was really nothing unusual, uh, Robert. I just 
I got to walk back and forth. I got to see things that did not change, unlike a dream. Um, the counters didn't change. The photo albums, uh, I looked at pictures that didn't change. Um, the rotary phone on a counter did not change. Uh, and I got to walk back and forth as much as I wanted and just experience this place. And it caused like an identity crisis in me at some point when I didn't know who or what I was for a while. Wow. Wow. That's, that's so, that's so wild. And then did you ever have an experience with these, was there an experience with actual beings too, like that you can remember? So this, this was with beings, um, though they were sort of in the backdrop and, and there's not a lot more to the condensed version of the story, except to say that when I started to freak out and I thought something's not right here. Um, and this has happened to me in a number of uh, experiences when I sort of twig in, uh, to the fact that I might be manipulated, I'm being manipulated. Um, I was ushered out of, uh, of this uh, place, this apartment. I, uh, I was ushered across a, a large field like an airport tarmac. Um, I had one brown skinned being on each side of me. And there were quite a few other people, the same humans, uh, who had brown skinned people on each side of them. And, and we walked to, um, what I took to be uh, like going through customs, you know, this is what my mind said. I'm going through yeah. customs and uh, I got into an elevator that was only built for one person. It was more like a cone uh, built for one, you know, the door swished uh, closed. Um, I felt intense motion and light from above and light from below. And when the door opened again, I was back at the airport. So that's pretty much the whole experience. That's, that's an amazing experience. There's, there's so much to unpack there. But like, let me ask you this. When this first started happening to you, you're, you're a prestigious college professor. Like, did this like question your, like, I, the, did this question your sanity? Uh, when, when you have a quote here that when Michelle put in the notes, she put, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbably, must be the truth. And so you're just you, cutting out a bit there, Robert, talking about being a professor and if this affected me day to day, were you saying? I was saying like, did they, like you're a prestigious professor. You know, I know that you're a college professor. Did this question your sanity for a little bit? Did you think that something mm -hmm. was wrong? Like, because you're so used to the regular, um, you, I, mean, I think to be a college professor, you have to be open-minded, right? So I'll, I say that, but um, also you're living in a world of very regular day-to-day -day things, right? It's very regular life, right? You're not, you weren't in this world of ufology. It's like kind of like you got thrust in it with your experiences. Am mm -hmm. I correct? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then I, uh, I so I, I guess the, sorry, please. So we have a delay. I, it's, it's my fault. You were saying? So if you, oh yeah, sorry. Okay, I thought I thought we were we're getting some radio silence there for a sec. Um, I. Uh, after this experience of the 1980s, then it sort of dogged me for all these years, for 17, 18 years. I got to a point where I was not feeling settled, not feeling happy. I was nervous. Um, I was not sleeping well. Uh, I'm an insomniac, but all this may have started with this experience. I can't tell. So um, I was, uh, you know, I'd go to bed at night and I'd be afraid to close my eyes, quite literally. I'd sometimes sleep with the light on. Um, I was married at the time and um, my now ex would, would come in and wonder what the heck is going on with me. And I was starting to get really frustrated because I'd only told uh, her and maybe one other uh, person. And then I had to, you know, I had to go to class and I teach technology. Uh, so it's pretty logical down to earth stuff, um, you know, left brain stuff. And, and I thought, you know what, this is starting to affect me day to day. Uh, it's, it's starting to impact me day to day. I'm not feeling right. I'm getting temperamental. 
Um, and, and I guess I, you know, the lack of sleep and the uncertainty about what was going on. So I finally decided to go see a hypnotherapist. Yeah. And, and then you thank God you found Leslie because she's such a great hypnotherapist. Um, I, I wanted to ask you this, like, do you see these experiences as a negative thing or do you agree with a lot of people that say it's a spiritual transformation or it's an expansion of consciousness or do you think these are more negative? What would you say? I, I would tell you quite honestly, I have the number of negative experiences I've had. I can almost count on one hand. I can count on two hands. And, and I'm speaking maybe 60 to 70 discrete experiences. So I've only had a handful that have been what I term as negative or frightening. Uh, most of the rest have been uplifting. And I have to say, honestly, I think uh, an opportunity for me to evolve. Uh, to evolve my consciousness, to evolve my spirituality, um, to to eventually end up on a show like your show, and and feel okay uh, about telling people, hey, you know, we're not so human, quote unquote, as we might think. Our origins are perhaps not from here. I I believe so too. I mean, there's stories of the Anunnaki. I love that story of Enki and Enlil and. And then there's actually, you know, if you go mm -hmm. to Australia, I mean, I just had Paul Wallace on my show. He talks about the different, like every, it seems like every race, uh, you know, around the world has an ET contact story or a, a story of ancient alien abduction or current alien abduction. You know, if you go to the Native Americans, to the, the Africans, to the, uh, everybody, you know what I mean? The South Americans, um, it seems uh, the uh, that RH negative ask people have a very interesting. Are you RH negative? I actually don't believe I am. And the, the funny thing is, um, we were Leslie and I were hoping at one point to call in a, a medical doctor um, to do some tests like blood tests and so forth before and after hypnosis. And that would have been the sure thing at that point. Um, I would have found out, and I've never asked my own MD, but um, uh, due to probably restrictions of the medical community, which I don't understand, um, uh, this individual wasn't willing to come in and do that. But we did, we did a couple of things. We did my blood pressure and uh, before and after, and it was kind of unusual. And we also just anecdotally noticed how damn hot it got in her treatment room a few times, like the temperature was up. And when I came out of hypnosis, she'd be sweating just like I was. Wow. And and is it true that you tried to, it's not only that you brought up past memories with these beings. I heard you say in another podcast that you kind of like in real time made contact with these beings. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Leslie and I, just uh, so you and, and your audience knows, uh, did about 35 sessions. We did a lot. Um, so after, I don't know how many, perhaps 20, uh, maybe more, maybe less, we uh, we explored the idea of could I communicate with this race that seems to be a primary race in my life. And there's a primary being who's been with me since I was a little kid and probably um, before birth. So we thought, could we contact her and ask her some questions and try and get answers about things that we were both interested in. So we did a bunch of sessions where we felt we were in communication with her uh, in real time. Um, Leslie sensed, I, I won't say she saw with her physical eyes, but sensed an overlay on me of a taller being, as if a taller being had overlaid itself on me. And I felt pretty weird uh, during those times. I felt like I was in motion. I felt hot um, periodically. I felt a bit nauseous. Periodically, I felt like I might pass out. Um, none of that happened, uh, but we communicated with this being I, I've called my twin. Uh, and just to ask her things about emotion, about what my next steps are, um, a little bit about her race, a little bit about whether they were ever human, things like this. So I don't have all that uppermost in my mind, but it was a fascinating um, discovery. And, and I have to say, Robert, once I 
I challenged her on emotions, uh, which is a bad idea, bad idea, um, because she, uh, she sent uh, uh, I don't know what, a package, a bomb of emotions over me, which I almost could not cope with. Um, because I think I, I almost accused her and her race of like, you have no idea what this is like. You know, I'm not getting enough sleep. I don't feel well. Um, I can't simply call on you to appear in my living room. You know, it was like, like, a, like a bitch kind of session, pardon the expression. And so what... <laughs> Within seconds of me sort of accusing her of that, um, wow, she let loose with some emotions that were overwhelming. Wow. Um, I mean, it's so weird how they can, these races can have control over us, right? They, they uh, Yeah. I mean, but I, I feel like we have abilities too. And I, I feel like we have, and, and actually the remote viewer, and I say this on my podcast, I, I don't want my audience to think I'm being redundant, but I have to tell you because you're an experiencer and I want to get your um, it, it, your your thoughts on this. Like I had Lynn Buchanan, the remote viewer on my show, and he told me that, he, you know, he's remote viewed right. good, good and bad species of ETs. And he said the good ones are, you know, they're, they're happy about us developing our psychic abilities because you know, we have long range psychic abilities like we can remote view, whereas the aliens seem to have a, an ability where they can, can take control of our minds if they're over us, it seems like. But, you know, and he said the negative ETs are a little bit scared about our psychic abilities, that we can, that we have a lot of human potential. What are your thoughts on that as you being an experiencer? I'd say good for the last point. Good they're afraid of us. <laughs> um, the other part is I, I, uh, I know of Lynn Buchanan. I don't know him personally, but I, I took remote viewing uh, training with uh, David Morehouse, um, another well-known remote viewer. I took um, coordinate remote viewing and extended remote viewing because it's been a fascination of mine for a number of years. And then I've experimented with a uh, another fellow, a friend of mine that's also trained under David Morehouse. And uh, we've gotten some real fascinating results. And, and I, I tend to agree with what you just said. Um, and I think we're silly if we don't think there are good aliens and bad aliens. Um, the number of species, we really don't know, Robert. It's been estimated at, you know, 70, 80, 90 that we know of. Um, but there are probably many, many more, probably thousands more. And so I'm fortunate. I've been hooked up with the good aliens who are aware of my psychic capabilities. And mm -hmm. Leslie and I have talked about that. So it's an interesting road to go down. Um, were my psychic abilities something that attracted them or simply did it help them reach me? Yeah, it, that's a good question. That makes a lot of sense. Like, and I was going to say, like, um, what I was what I was going to say is, are the are you having experiences with what we would call hybrids too? Is that a silly question, or is that is that normal? I, I think it's a normal question, and, and um, I can only speculate. Quite honestly, it's my understanding from uh, listening or reading various authors and just chit chatting with other people like me or chit chatting with Leslie, that if a hybrid's really, how could I put this? Uh, well done, created really well. Um, we'd never know. That's, that's my understanding of it, that we, if, if they were really, uh, a, an excellent, a hybrid who, who incorporated all, all humanity has to offer in their expression and emotions and the way they talk and their intelligence, we probably never know um, that we're speaking to a hybrid. I've had a couple of people ask me and it's like, I don't know. I, and I really don't know. Do you think you could possibly be like a, a hybrid? Maybe that's why they contacted you. Did you ever think about that? Or maybe you're at least a star seed. I have. Yeah, I, I thought about both things and, and, and it's, it, Maybe an interesting clue for me has come in that on a handful of occasions, I've been taken to see children. And in some cases, the children look real, real normal in the sense of human looking. Um, they might be outstanding, some of them, in terms of, uh, you know, little kids with very blonde hair and 
striking blue eyes. Uh, but then some of the other children I've been taking to see don't don't seem like they they worked out, meaning that I don't think they're they're here on Earth. I think they will never be here on Earth. Um, but I've been taken to be in the company of little alien children, and I and I think Robert, all of it has to do with them wanting to know how my emotions are doing, what's going on in my mind when I'm in that situation. I, I think that's a good point because I hear that some of the species don't have emotions like us, or maybe they don't work off emotion. And one, one interesting thing I, I heard was, I heard, um, if you ever heard of Cliff High, he's a, he, he does like, he's had ET experiences and he's had like psychedelic experiences. He's in the UFO community. Um, he seems like a real nice guy, but he was explaining that you know, our emotions come from our vagus nerve system, which is somewhere in our gut, you know. And he said that uh, he went in through these psychedelic experiences that some of these experience, uh, some of these beings like express their emotions on, you know, like throughout their, 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 uh, when he was in the psychedelic experience, he could sense it on their skin, like it would vibrate through a color or they, 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 they either didn't have emotions or their emotions were expressed very differently than ours. Do you think this is possible or do you think this is a, like maybe why they're, they're interested in us because of our emotions? I think it's a very good reason. Um, uh, this is a, a, one of the conclusions I've come to personally, subjectively maybe, that a lot of the experiences I've gone through, whether I was physically abducted or psychically abducted, involve situations where I would have emotions, whether it was a birthday party or whether it was being on the run uh, with my uh, ex-wife running away from them and then being captured <laughs> and taken to a lab. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's a, a goodly number of experiences I've had that have, have involved emotion. And I think they're fascinated um, uh, by, by observing us experiencing emotion. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, I think I heard you say this in another show. Are some of them shapeshifters? I mean, like, have we ever seen their true form? And like, do you think they can appear to us how they want us to see them? I suspect that's very true. Um, I can't remember the author's name, but there was a, a, an author, I think, from Britain who who uh, interviewed personally and had a slideshow to go with it. I wish I had thought of her name tonight. And um, she interviewed uh six different uh, hybrids who were shapeshifters. I think all of them, or maybe four or five of the six, and they would change before her eyes. Wow. And what does that really mean? Does it mean they physically changed or caused her um, to perceive uh, a different being? This part I don't know, uh, but she was real convincing. Um, and she spent time with each of these hybrid uh, individuals. So that was pretty fascinating. It really kick-started my interest in that. Yeah, and well, you know what's so interesting? It seems like a phenomenon, and I've talked about this in many shows. So again, I don't want to be redundant, but I just want to get your opinion on it because you're an experiencer and I value your opinion. Like, it seems like the phenomena changes with time. Like, for example, the fairies of the 18th century are now the gray aliens of the 20th and 21st century. It seems like the phenomena has a different face throughout time. People in Celtic times, old 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 Celtic times, would be taken up in a glen or a mist, which we could relate to abduction. And now people are taken away in a craft, and we can relate you know physical UFOs to abductions. I mean, it doesn't seem like the government wants to do that. They want to think that it's all nuts and bolts and it's maybe Russian technology. But I think the alien part of the abduction. But what are your thoughts on the first question of that the phenomena does change its face throughout time? I totally agree with that. Um, you know, there was in, in more biblical times than say we're living in now, Ezekiel's wheel, wheels of fire, um, apparent angels coming from objects or crafts in the sky, being presented to people as they could process it as yeah. they could deal it in their terms, in their context. I mean, showing them a flying saucer some seven, 800 years ago, or a thousand years ago, it just might not have made any sense, whatever. Um, so I've always felt that they adjust 
uh, they adjust with humanity to see what we can cope with and what we expect. And they sometimes just deliver uh, to us what we expect in terms of how they look, the kind of craft, the situation they put us in. Um, they're not, I don't think, always showing us the whole deal, you know, the full Monty. I think they're showing us individual representation of what we can deal with or cope with. And do you think that has to go into with disclosure? And what are your thoughts on the whole disclosure thing with the congressional hearings? And there's a lot going on. It seems like a, a peak time for interest in this subject. Like, it seems like it, it's, it keeps ramping up and ramping up, but it's slow increments. Like, maybe that's done purposely by the aliens, or maybe the government knows a lot more than we think, maybe a little bit of both. What do you think? I, I, I know that you at the UAP phenomenon, as they now call it, um, uh, it's, it's flying saucers by any other name, <laughs> UFOs by any other name, but they can call it what they wish. I think they're drip feeding us quite honestly, um, yeah. weaning us on to the idea um, that we're not alone. I think the days are gone, Robert. I hope they're gone. When if they made a major announcement saying, yes, we're dealing with this alien species, the Palladians, uh, you know, half the world would shrug their shoulders, you know. Uh, part of the world would go, yeah, for sure, right? You know, and a small percentage might get all uptight about it. But um, I think their disclosure is drip fed to us, even through major blockbuster motion pictures. Yeah, I think we're going through a mass awakening. And I think we people have talked about this. And I think that our consciousness is expanding. So I think with the, the, the society consciousness expansion, um, you know, maybe we're more ready for this kind of information now. I, I I tend to agree with you. I mean, we're seeing inspired filmmakers, for instance, like uh, Denny Villeneuve, um, giving us something like Arrival and other movies that are so thought stimulating that you say to yourself, "There's got to be a grain of truth in a uh, truth in there," and even though we're not 100% positive. And then I think we both know, and probably your audience, there's a global movement toward disclosure uh, led by folks like Dr. Greer and a whole lot of others um, that, that are trying to get on board with this. And they enlist the aid of people uh, in the Senate and the military, experts now, experts who used to be alive. Um, and they've had at least two, I'm going to say, conferences. Um, and, and I don't know where it's getting us because apparently prying that info out of the military is hard even for senators. Yeah, it is. And, and I mean, like they, they brought up Maelstrom and they brought up uh, the Admiral Wilson leak and they had no clue. The UFO, UAP committee had no clue about Maelstrom, about the UFOs apparently going over our nukes. And, you know, it just seems like they're a little bit behind or that's they're making it look that way. And I've talked about this before as well. Like it seems like maybe they don't know either. They don't know or they know a lot and they're not telling. And they, if you heard in that hearing, they said, We'll save this. There, there were certain subjects where they were like, we'll save this for the closed hearing. They had a closed hearing, too, that they didn't allow the public into. And, you know, um, I'm, I'd love to hear. I'd love to have been a bird on the window at those closed hearings to hear what they, they really <laughs> talked about. Because I don't think for one second that any of this is Russian technology or Chinese, you know? I oh, mean, my gosh. I don't think so either. That's to me, a front, you know, to me, it's, it's window dressing. To me, it's like the art of illusion. Look at this hand, not the other hand, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, one thing that you, you, that Michelle wrote in the notes here was that you, spirit or etheric abductions versus physical abductions. Have you had both? Yes. As far as I know, um, Leslie might say, and, and we've talked about this a lot, um, that uh, the physical abductions don't happen to everyone and don't happen forever. Um, there's a point at which I don't want to say you graduate away from physical abductions because I'm not sure if I still go through them, but there's a point at which it's not needed, um, at which we, uh, in a way, we reach an, a, a, an age of intelligence or consent. Uh, where we say, you know, I've had enough of being shunted around by, by you creatures. Um, is there any way I could have a say in this? And my personal theory is around that point, which is, I'm going to say late teens or later than that, um, 
there's some degree of buy-in uh, in what happens to you. Now, I might not be able to control where I end up, like at an airport or in an underground facility, but I've got more and more control over what I do when I get there. That's pretty interesting because I, I don't know if you remember this story or if you follow the phenomena at all, but there was a guy named Jim Sparks who had, um, he had full conscious recall of his abductions and he remembered mass abductions where he, he was taken part of. And what was interesting, there was a couple interesting things about this. He remembered being on the ship with the greys and the greys would let him walk around. He would lead other abductees to do certain tasks that the greys wanted. There was mm -hmm. a story where he was told that there was all these monitors set up in a room and he had to see all the abductees. It's the, the abductees were in like a catatonic zombified state and he had to lead them to these monitors in which the greys turned on some uh, screen that says you're killing your planet, you're killing your planet, which I totally agree with. I think we are mm -hmm. ruining our planet. But have you gotten messages like this? Like, And do you have recall of your abductions as well? I have recalled many of my uh, abductions. And it's interesting that you mentioned view screens. Um, those have show, shown up in three or four of my uh, scenarios, experiences. And they were initially two-dimensional. Um, but they're projecting three or fourth dimensional images out of them. So the technology was phenomenal. I mean, it'd be like you and I looking at a flat panel monitor or TV screen, and then the image becomes three or four dimensional, like a hologram, um, and it conveys a lot of information. Um, so I don't, I've never gotten a lot of information about saving the planet, but I have gotten a lot of information about being more aware. Um, and, and it's funny because I, I, um, I connect those two. If you're more aware, are you going to consciously do things like ruin the planet? Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that we're at a time now where we as a species can look, we can, we can look at the UFO phenomenon, but then tie it to the, the other bigger problems that we have in life. Like we are a warring species. We have nuclear missiles all pointed at each other and we could kill each other any second. And I think the, the ETs recognize this and they say, whoa, hold up. If you guys set off a nuke, you, when you did it in Hiroshima, it sent a reverberation throughout the universe and it ripped a hole in a dimension. I've, I've heard that. So I've heard someone else say that. That's not me. But I think when we have nuclear wars, it causes problems. So I think that we can use the phenomena and, you know, tie it to some of the bigger issues like nuclear war. And, and we have throughout time, right? I'm not the only one. I'm not like new news that I'm talking about here. Like, <laughs> but what do you think about that? Do you think it's something that we should be addressing? I, well, you know, uh, uh, alien craft appearing over nuclear silos is a thing, as you've mentioned earlier. It's a known thing. It's a recorded thing. Um, so I, I don't think we can dispute that it happened. Um, the military is not too interested in knowing that someone else can shut off their nukes. I don't think they're too interested in that scenario. But um, somebody asked me, uh, a close friend, when uh, uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine, um, why don't they step in now, uh, meaning alien races? And uh, it, it took me aback. I, I wish I had a better answer for her. But my answer was, I don't think they'll step in unless we get to the brink. Yeah, and, I agree. And then, then I hope, and it's my understanding that they would, and that's apparently from them. That's what they say, too. I mean, it makes you wonder, like, and, and I'm not trying to get off topic, but how did we even get in this position? It's like people with power that get power hungry, and then they acquire weapons of mass destruction. The next thing you know, they're all pointed at each other. and then at least people like us saying, what the F, like, you know, like yeah. this, I think what I'm getting to is like, we all need to be more consciously aware and then we can fix these problems where, you know, we can, like, I'll tell you a story. I was just listening to Joe Rogan podcast today and he had Tim Kennedy on, who was like an ex UFC fighter. UFC is like the MMA, but Tim Kennedy is also like a, a special forces in the, you know, uh, armed forces and he was talking about the pullout of Afghanistan and um, how he and some other people went back in to get some of those people out of Afghanistan because they were they would have been under Taliban control but I guess where I'm going with this is like 
I think everybody needs to be more consciously aware of what's going on in the world and be more peaceful towards each other. And maybe the alien races are trying to convey that to us. Do you think? I do think. I do think that. And I think it's a worthy topic to talk about any time, uh, any place. As long as we have people who are fearful, um, you know, people who are selfish, people that feel personally threatened because someone else has wealth or someone else has power. As long as we have people like that, we're doomed, you know? And so the more people I, I think, and I hope people like yourself and myself um, can, can talk and say, let's focus on something else, all right? Let's change the narrative. Yeah, and I hope that's what we're coming to in uh, society. But um, I wanted to ask you this, like, uh, what, what's your second, I know what Intersections is about. That's about your hypnosis sessions with Leslie and the contact, but you have a new book out and it's called The Experiencer's Garden. Why did you choose The Experiencer's Garden and what can readers expect from this book? So the first book was, was pretty unique in that Leslie and I co-wrote it. And Leslie uh, spoke to, from a hypnotherapist standpoint, some of the things I was going through. You know, she was there as the hypnotherapist. So she actually spoke to, well, I think this is what Wes was experiencing. And I think this is what was going on. I thought that was very cool. Um, but the second book, uh, An Experiencer's Garden, was meant to classify the, uh, the various components of experiences. For instance, where do they take place? Um, are they on a craft? Are they on Earth? What kinds of aliens have I interacted with? Um, are, are there emotions at stake? Um, is there anybody with me in these experiences? Um, what were the outcomes? Um, so all those kinds of questions, I tried to categorize the experiences by virtue of location and so forth and so on, uh, and lessons learned and things like that. And then I devoted the last part of the book to try to come to terms with the why me question, um, which it, everybody should ask that and then accept it, <laughs> in my humble opinion. Ask away, but chances are if you're asking it, you're there. Yeah, yeah. And did, what did you come up with with the why me? I mean, there's a lot of uh, questions. Like I could ask you this: like, were your were your family? Do you know if your parents or I don't know if you have kids, but were your parents abductees as well, or do you think they ever saw a UFO even? So this part I don't know. Um, I do know that at least one member of my family seems to have had encounters. I do know that the partner I'm living with now, Anna, seems to have encounters. Um, so I'm going to say it runs in the family, uh, which is no surprise to me at all at this stage. It just courses through the family. Um, the, the rest of the why me, uh, can, I, I, I finally got to explain it to my own satisfaction when I did a interlife hypnosis session. I, I'm not sure if Leslie talked about that on your show. We, I, I, I've heard of interlife hypnosis session. That's between lives, right? Yes. That's so interesting to me. I love the the uh, afterlife uh, conversation. Like I love hearing about NDEs, and you know, I, I, I'd love to hear about it if you don't mind. You know. No, no, not at all. So I, when I came to think about why me, I thought, well, when I was younger, I knew I had some psychic ability uh, from early teens. Uh, and uh, Leslie feels, and I think it's right, that that's you broadcasting, come get me, you know, that's, that's you basically say, I'm here, you know, do you want to come <laughs> in my life? Uh, so, I, so that's fine. I think that's part of it. Uh, the fact that I am open, that I do not have blinders on, that I feel 24-7 at all times, all people in the world uh, have company. You know, it could be your dead relatives or dead family. It could be alien beings. It could be beings from another dimension. But I have zero doubt in my own mind that I'm surrounded by beings at all times. So uh, Leslie mentioned this possibility of an interlife regression uh, where basically um, you're, you're regressed back to beyond the age of zero. Uh, so you regress back to a former life, not the one just prior, but another former life. And then you move forward uh, to the point where you die in that life. So you've got consciousness of what's going on as you move forward to this world between lives, life between lives. And then generally speaking, uh, Robert, and this happened to me, um, you're in front of a council of some kind, 
my council wasn't comprised only of humans. There were aliens there. Uh, but you're in front of a council that's basically going, you know, make sure one day, Wes, you wake up and become aware of all this. And they're also, they were also interested to know if I was in agreement uh, with moving forward with, uh, uh, with an understanding I had with alien life forms. Was I okay with that understanding? Assuming that one day uh, I'd, I'd say it out loud. One day I'd say, that's it. That's me. This is what I was supposed to remember in this life. And I'm still alive and I remembered it. That, that's amazing. That's amazing. So it's all about understanding and, and, and opening our awareness to new areas of uh, extraterrestrial life and interdimensional life and everything in between, right? I think we need to do that. I think we're fooling ourselves. Um, most of the world we live in is unseen. Yeah, yeah. And, th and that's proven with the electromagnetic light spectrum. We only see like 5% of the electromagnetic light spectrum, which is, it almost makes me think like we're in some kind of Petri dish, like we're an experiment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, I do. Because, it, 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 uh, you know, we're, it's just so weird. It's, there's so many questions. Like, it seems like we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're being watched at all times and they're testing how we, it, it's almost like we're in the matrix, you know? I fully think that, you know, my partner and I talk about what is, what is this, um, you know, and we say it's holographic, you know, it's a projection. And if that's true, then you and me and these computers and the room we're sitting in, that's a projection too. And if that's all true, we can become just about anything we want. We can yeah. really grow. Did you ever read that book by Michael Talbot? It's called The Holographic Universe. I'm aware of it. I haven't read it, but I probably love it from what I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm 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 in the more of agreement that we're in some kind of simulation. It seems like I yeah. don't know if we're like plugged in somewhere, but I think one of the things that, that is very real is our consciousness. Like I think our souls. I don't know if the consciousness and soul are connected. Maybe consciousness comes out from somewhere and the brain's the antenna and then the soul is maybe something different. It's very complicated, but it's all so interesting, you know? I, yeah, I love talking about this. If I didn't have to work, um, you know, during the daytime, I'd devote my life to it. Me too. I, I, I work a full-time <laughs> job as well. I know what it's like, but I, I look forward to these conversations. Well, if you want to tell everybody of your website and um, – how they can find the books and all that stuff and you know yeah sure would love to um my site's uh, perennially under construction it's it's not that it's incomplete it's you know stuff is there um but i'm advertising some workshops which i'm gonna have to delay i was hoping to launch in july um but the first workshop's going to be on how i how i personally dealt with uh, the trauma i went through how i coped you know, and hypnotherapy is one of the many ways I coped and, and, and magic and relaxation and talking to people. So it's a series of workshops that I'll probably have to delay, but folks can find out about it at wesgroberts.com. Okay. And then the so books are books all on Amazon? books are also listed there as well. Okay. Books are on Amazon CA, Amazon.com. And I think there's uh, live links to the books on my website. And yeah, I'd love it. I'd love it when folks find an interest in this and, and want to go buy a book. It's not why I do what I do. Um, if I, if I was uh, getting rich off the books, I wouldn't be working. <laughs> so <laughs> It's not about the money aspect for me. I, I love that. I love that you want to get the truth out. I mean, that's the whole point of why I do this. You know, that's I, I want to get the, the, the truth out to people. Well, I want to thank you for taking your time out to speak with me. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad that I finally got to tie together Leslie because Leslie's such a great person. Now I met you. You're a great person. So this was amazing. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Anytime I can get a chance to talk and spread the word and say to people, take the first step. You can, you can take the first step. It's okay. You'll get through it. Anytime I can do that, I'm good. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Have a good night. I will do that. And thank you again. Have a great night. All right.